We're to work our way through Matthew's Gospel. There's an, just so much in this particular section that, uh, again, I think we get a little ambitious, wondering how far we're going to go, but uh, we'll, we'll take our time and uh, we'll cover it all. But there is something here that this morning that we really want to touch upon, which is probably the most important question that will ever be uh, confronted by man. Uh, who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Because what one thinks and what one believes about that determines their eternal destiny. And so it is the most important question that man will ever answer. And so uh, in Matthew's Gospel, we're going to begin reading this morning in chapter 16, verse 5. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 5. And when his disciples had come to the other side... They had forgotten to take bread. And then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But when Jesus perceived it, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves, because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? And then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I... The Son of Man am. And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, and some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. This is God's word for us this morning. Father, we ask that you touch our hearts. Minister to us, Lord, the significance, God, of just this interaction that is taking place here, Lord, with your disciples. The importance of it, Lord, for, for all of us today. For, Lord, believers as well as non-believers. And, Father, we pray that you would just touch our hearts and that your word would be clear today. And, Lord, that we would come with ears to hear what the Spirit would say. That we would come with expectation and, and anticipation, Lord, that you will touch our hearts. Lord, may each one of us be changed today from the inside out. Speak to each one of us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For almost three years, Jesus has been very patient, if you will, with the religious elite of Israel. Those who opposed him, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But after his last encounter that we looked at last time and their absolutely ridiculous challenge to him, show us a sign. Prove to us with one more sign. And this was a sign from heaven, you remember. They were getting specific with him. But prove to us once again who you are and why you do the things you do and say the things you do. With all of that and the challenge and, and all, but the workings that he had done among them, it was certainly uh, apparent who he was. And the question was really a ridiculous question. And so we read in verse 4 last time as we closed, he left them and departed. When Jesus isn't wanted, he won't stick around. He wants to be wanted. So hearts must be opened to Him. And there can come a time when the heart is so closed and so turned off to Him and His love and His grace 
that he is just not there. Not because he's not there, but really because a person doesn't want him to be there. And so he won't intrude where he is not wanted. But he's basically had enough of them and their antagonism. He's not in, they're not interested in any proof that he might give that he is the promised Messiah. All they really wanted to do was get rid of him. In fact is, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. And so he left once again for the region of the Galilee, which had really become a, a safe retreat for him, where he wouldn't really be antagonized by uh, them anymore. And he would be able to spend some final moment, moments now with his disciples without distraction. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is about three months away from the cross. And when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And verse 7 says, They reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have taken no bread. But when Jesus perceived it, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have not brought bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? This is one of those sad but amusing stories where his disciples just didn't get what Jesus was saying to them. They had spent almost three years with him and still they were living more or less on a horizontal plane and completely missed the spiritual point that he was making about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, which was misrepresentation, if you will, of God and a relationship with him and his word. Jesus had had many serious encounters with the scribes and the Pharisees. Not so many with the Sadducees. The Sadducees will kind of pick up their cause after the crucifixion, and we read more about them in the book of Acts. But certainly with the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, he has had many serious encounters with them, and very soon his disciples would also be engaged in confrontation with them. Jesus was not concerned that they had forgotten to bring, a, about a, to bring bread with them. Uh, as he has just shared with them, he is more than able to provide for that if necessary. But what he was concerned with was that they would be prepared and ready for uh, the encounter and the, inter and the interaction that they would eventually have with the spiritual leaders of Israel who were opposed to Christ. And this was going to happen in the very near future when Jesus would no longer be with them in the flesh. Verse 11, how is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread. But you know, leaven was used, a little piece of, 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 of leaven. It was like a starter that would permeate all of the dough and it would make the bread rise. But what it was was an influence throughout the whole that he was talking about. And the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees was the, was the influence that they had, the, the really corruptive influence that they had among the people of God. And so he said, then that they understand that, they, that they, he didn't tell them to beware of the, the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so here it is that they put two together, two and two together. It was like the light had just been turned on. They understood for the first time what he was talking about. And here it is that they were to realize and to recognize uh, that the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day uh, were, uh, they had false doctrine. The Pharisees were the self-proclaimed saints. Uh, they were the separatists. That's really what the word Pharisees mean. They, they walked around with an air about them, separated from the common people. They wouldn't uh, really even approach or come close to, to the common people, but they were the self-proclaimed saints uh, of the day. They were the interpreters or the recognized interpreters of the law, but also 
of their traditions, that which was added uh, to the law. The Sadducees were the religious aristocracy, the party of the priesthood. Many of the priests, uh, the high priests, came from uh, the Sadducees. But Jesus said that they were both phonies. He said that neither one of them really knew or had a personal uh, relationship with God. They had a religious facade about them. They looked good on the outside, but basically what looked good on the outside was only skin deep. And so here when he speaks of the leaven, he's speaking about how both of these groups had, con had corrupted the things of God. Throughout Scripture, leaven is spoken of as an evil influence. And so when Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's speaking about the evil influence that these two groups had in perverting the Word of God with their traditions and their false teachings. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus says that the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. And when we first read about that word, when uh, he addressed them as hypocrites, we remember that this word means an actor. They were people that Jesus was saying was like an actor on a stage who was pretending to be someone that they were not. And so when he says here that, they're, that the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy, it was they appeared on the outside to have a, a religious uh, piety, if you will. Uh, but they were imposters. They taught that the obedience to the law and their traditions was the way to please God, but also to bring about then His kingdom upon earth. And so the leaven of the, the Pharisees was hypocrisy, and their hypocrisy was legalism. Everything was a series of rules and regulations of do's and don'ts. And it was a very, uh, a very uh, strict um, little uh, thing that they had going here. It was religious works. But they basically believed that they could prove to God that they were good enough really to enter into heaven. And there's a lot of that that goes on today in church today. A lot of people are caught up in this that if, uh, if they just... They'll be good enough. They'll be able to show God, God, you know, I am worthy of your kingdom by the things that I do, by, the, by my good works and, and all. But this is not what Jesus nor what God will accept. They had set themselves up as the standard by which any comparison was to be made. But Jesus said that it's not your standard, it's my standard. It's the standard of God. Any other standard other than that is a false standard and it's a standard that cannot be attained. The fact is, no man can even come up to the standard of Jesus Christ. You remember that at one point in time, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise even see or enter in to the kingdom of God. Now this had to be a shock for these men that he had just started uh, to really teach and, and um, had begin, begun to draw near with and to reveal the truth of God's uh, word to them. Because they looked at these men as the standard. They were the ones of whom everyone else were at least made to feel that they had to be compared to. But Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not even see uh, the kingdom of heaven. And so here, uh, the, the, uh, the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy and legalism, uh, they were separatists. They had set themselves apart uh, from all uh, of the other people. I, I want to point out today that I believe that Roman Catholicism uh, would really include this kind of thinking today. They are the one supposed one true church. Um, they are the ones that says, you know, if you belong to, my, to this church, if you uh, adhere to the teachings of the Pope and all, then you're really in. But once again, God says, my son, not some church, but my son is the standard of comparison. But I believe because of this permeating the quote-unquote Christian church today, I, because of this, the, the, the rules of the do's and the don'ts and the regulations that, uh, that cannot really be attained by man, 
the standards supposedly that have been set up, I believe that has turned many away from God today. I believe that many have walked away saying, there's no way I can make it. There's no way I'm really going to get it. I guess I'll just take my chances and we'll see what happens. And they consider maybe salvation to be like a roll of the dice. They think that, you know, well, maybe, just maybe, you know, they'll see something good in me. And you know, when God sees something good in us, you know what it is? It's Jesus Christ. It's that Jesus Christ has taken his rightful place in our hearts and in our lives. Because in and of ourselves, we have no goodness. But our goodness is found in Christ when we're clothed in his righteousness through faith in him. Through submitting to him, through coming to him to receive the grace that God offers and gives so freely through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul said to Titus in chapter 3, verse 5, he says, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. It's not by us and the efforts that, that we might put forth to be good, by keeping a set of standards of rules and regulations. Yes, being obedient to his word is key and it is important but not certainly to the traditions. You remember just a few, well, probably months ago now, we had that conversation, Jesus had that conversation too, you know, how uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Pharisees, you know, were, were telling uh, Jesus, you know, how you don't, um, uh, you know, abide by our traditions. And he got into a thing about uh, the law. Your traditions mean nothing. It's the law of God. But it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through 7 very important words for us as believers, even to meditate upon and reflect upon, not by works of righteousness, but according to His mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. You know, we don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve His forgiveness. We don't deserve His grace. But mercy is not getting what we do deserve. What is it that man deserves? Man deserves death. Man deserves a death sentence to be separated from God for all eternity. But in His grace, it's getting what we, what we don't deserve. And we get His love. We get His forgiveness. And this free gift of salvation that He has offered. So the hypocrisy of the Pharisees was legalism. The hypocrisy of the Sadducees was liberalism and indifference. They were the rationalists of the day. They were the materialists. They, they didn't believe at all in the supernatural. So we, it's kind of interesting how these two groups, you know, would come together, you know, because they really seem like they're diametrically opposed to one another, and in essence, they are. These two groups, the religious leaders and, and elite of Jesus' day, they didn't get along with one another. But they did find the common cause to come against Jesus Christ. That was the only common ground that they had. But the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the supernatural. They only believed in the here and now. Miracles, not a, they, didn't, they did not believe in miracles. So all of the, the mighty works and the miracles that Jesus had done, you know, I don't know what they attributed them to, but they certainly didn't attribute uh, them to the works of God. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And certainly they didn't then believe in a future kingdom that the Messiah was going to come and to establish. They believed simply in the here and now and that which they could really um, uh, you know, grab onto uh, and, and, and see right now. Something that was tangent. They were rationalists. They were materialists. But they, were, they too were blinded by their own self-serving and deceitful heart. And so Jesus gives warning to his disciples concerning them and goes on to fully reveal that he is the Messiah. So when Jesus came to the region, verse 13, of Caesarea Philippi, 
He asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So now he's, he's got them alone. He's explained to them, uh, and, and they've caught on to uh, this idea about the religious leaders here, and he's going to separate himself from them now. He's going to show to them that he is unique in all of history. That he is not one of the Pharisees. That he is not one of the Sadducees. That he is not one of the scribes. But he is unique in all of history. There is none like unto him. And he's going to draw this out of the disciples right now because they have to know this. They have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who he indeed is. And so first of all, he asked the question kind of generally. You know, you guys have been out there talking. You, you guys maybe have, have heard some of the conversations that have been going around as people have been talking about me and, and saying things about me. Who is it that men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now this phrase, the Son of Man, is a very uh, unique and interesting phrase in and of itself. Any Jew would have had no problem in understanding that it was an Old Testament reference to the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, Daniel makes clear reference uh, of, of the Messiah uh, being called the Son of Man. It really speaks of Jesus in his, in his humanity and also in his identification uh, with man. God coming to this earth and taking on the form of man and human uh, flesh and all and identif his identification with man. And so it speaks that when he speaks of himself and over 80 times uh, throughout the New Testament, this phrase is used of Jesus Christ, referring to him as the son of man. Jesus uses it quite often in the Gospels when speaking of himself because it does focus upon his identification uh, and uh, with man whom he came to save. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and this is a really, as I was, as I was studying um, uh, for this morning's message, Hebrews chapter 2 is just a powerful, powerful chapter, and I really encourage you to go, uh, go home and, and, and just read that as, as some devotional for, uh, for yourself. But Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so he had to be made like his brethren. God had to come from heaven to earth in order to save man, to identify with man. He had to be made like his brethren. To make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered. Christ suffered for us. He suffered a heavy cost that you and I might have eternal life. God sacrificed his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And what a barrier that word belief is, isn't it? We know from the people that we talk to, the ones that we come into contact with, those that we work with, family members. We talked about this on uh, last Sunday up at the campground. So many of our loved ones, our family members, are not saved. And if something isn't done about that, they're going to cross that line into eternity. And once one crosses that line into eternity, that's it. There aren't any candles that are going to be lit for someone that are going to get them into heaven. Man makes the decision here and now. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Jesus is drawing out of his disciples now the most critical question that man will be faced with. The most critical question that man will be faced with is right here what's taking place in this interaction in Caesarea Philippi right now, which is probably one of the most beautiful areas in Israel. When we go there, we'll visit there. It's in the northern part of Israel. It's the headwaters of the, 
the Jordan River, Mount Hermon, uh, Hermon, I, Hermon, you know, I'm country guys. Mount Hermon, uh, you know, looms in the background, and and it is just one of the most beautiful, beautiful places uh, in all, in all of Israel. But as the case is so many times with beautiful places, uh, as even we know here in Boulder, Colorado, which is a beautiful place. People want to come to Boulder, Colorado. They want to come to the mountains and uh, just to, because of the beauty of the place. And as so often it is with a beautiful place, it also becomes a center for all kinds of false worship and idol worship. And uh, as Caesarea Philippi had become... Uh, a place of false worship. There are many ruins there today, shrines and altars that can be seen today that give evidence uh, of the worship of many gods. And so um, what Jesus is really doing here is he wants, he is establishing himself uh, from all others that would be worshipped or raised up as gods. Herod the Great built the city in honor of Caesar Augustus. And we all know from the Christmas story that Caesar Augustus, um, you know, he didn't want to be called just the king. Uh, he, he didn't want to be called an, an emperor, per se, because, uh, you know, he, he saw the, the king as uh, a person who was there for a while and, the, and the was gone. But he wanted this title Augustus because it was a religious uh, title of deity. And so it was, it was, a, it was a title of him uh, actually deifying himself. And so Herod the Great built this city of Caesarea Philippi in honor of and in worshiping uh, Caesar Augustus. Uh, when his son became the tetrarch of the, uh, of the area, the overseer, the ruler of the area, he attached his name then, Philippi, to the city in honor of himself. No pride here, no arrogance here, you know. Here, I'll just put my name on this city, and now, uh, you know, people will, will worship me too. I mean, it was, it was a way, though, of, uh, of, of, wor of signifying worship. It was also a way of separating and distinguishing the Caesarea up in the northern part of Israel from the Caesarea that is down on the Mediterranean uh, coast. Uh, but here in the midst of this beautiful, beautiful place, uh, but so terribly dark spiritually, Jesus is asking this question of his disciples. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It was obvious because of the encounters that Jesus has had with the respected leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that it was time for this question to be asked. They had continuously misrepresented and denied the deity of Jesus, of who he was, that he was the Messiah. And Jesus' hour was quickly approaching. Through the Gospel of John, many times we read that his hour had not come, his hour had not come when he was in these confrontations and when it seemed like he had to escape from apprehension of being uh, killed or whatever even by them. But his, but his hour was quickly approaching. As I said before, he's about three months away now from going to Jerusalem where he will be uh, arrested, where he will be crucified, and where he will be buried, and where he will raise again uh, from the dead. But from here, uh, Jesus wants to really bring home to the hearts of uh, his disciples, because they're the ones that are going to be carrying on the message. And those are the ones that are going to be carrying on the message to us, even down today, his disciples. We're carrying on the very same message that he had this encounter with, with his disciples. Because it's the very same thing that we have had to answer in our heart. But as we're going to see in just a minute, it's going to get a lot more specific than just who to men. What is the popular opinion of the day who is it that men say that I am? But he's going to get very personal because it is a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ when he asks the question, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? How one answers this question will determine their eternal destiny. Not because one belongs or attends any specific church denomination. 
Not because one is a good person. Not because they have been baptized in water or gone through church ritual. But because one believes in their heart what Peter is about to confess here. Any misconception, any misunderstanding that his disciples had had up to now, Jesus wants it cleared out. He wants it cleared up. Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man. Who do they say that I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say one of the other prophets. What's going on here? You see, what's going on here is what's the popular opinion? What's the, what's the consensus of the people? And what is the answer? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, one of the most respected prophets, or Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. What, in essence, is being said about Jesus? He may be a forerunner of the Messiah, but he's not the Messiah. That's what's being said. He is not the one, but he is likened to those that came before him. That's what's being said. He's one of those special and recognized Jewish prophets, but not the Messiah. They were so close to the truth. But then again, so far away. How many people today embrace this kind of thinking? You know, most today will not deny that there was something very different about Jesus. But at the same time, they will deny that he is not the Messiah. That he came to this earth with the specific purpose in mind to save man from his sin. Today, religious people as well as non-religious people will grant that Jesus is unique in all of history. Oh, a great teacher. A man of much wisdom. A very spiritual man and leader. A good and caring person. But they will not recognize, they will not accept nor will they believe that he is indeed God come in the flesh, the Son of God who came to take away man's sin. But I just want to say something because there was a book written several years ago called Evidence the Demands a Verdict. And uh, the subtitle of that was Jesus Christ, Liar or Lunatic. Lord, Liar or Lunatic. And the truth of the matter is if Jesus was not who he said he was, indeed God, the Savior, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, if he was not who he said he was, then he was a liar. And I want to tell you something. A liar is not a good person. A liar is an evil person. A liar is a corrupt person. And we can take that right down the current events in history today. If Jesus wasn't who he said he was, then he was a liar. But if he was and is who he said, then he's Lord. And that demands something. That demands a response. And that's what Jesus is getting at right here. He's getting at a personal decision. There is one answer and one answer alone that's acceptable to God. Patronizing him by calling him a great leader, a great teacher, a great man, a good and caring man. Patronizing him in such a way will not open the doors of eternity. It's not going to open the doors of eternity. But that one answer that one answer that we're going to hear Peter give here in just a moment is the answer that God's looking for. He is the Christ, the Messiah. I also want to say, ultimately, it's not important what others think. 
or believe. But as Jesus gets to here, it's what you believe and what you think in your heart. It's a personal decision. It's a personal relationship. So Jesus pressures, pressures here. Um, only who do you say that I am? Uh, he pressures. He makes it personal. Who do you say that I am? People are not going to walk into heaven in large groups, in multitudes, in a crowd. We're going to go in individually, one by one, through that narrow gate. One's faith, though believed and accepted by many, is a, pers- is a personal and individual decision. Because one's husband or wife believes that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Savior, does not necessarily mean that their mate is going to be in heaven. Because a parent will enter into heaven because of their belief and faith in Jesus Christ, does not mean that a child is going to enter into heaven or vice versa. Because a person is a religious person and goes to church religiously, that doesn't necessarily mean that one's going to be into heaven either. Because one is a good person, none of this is criteria really for salvation. But what one believes about Jesus, who do you say I am? And that question is being asked to each one of us here this morning. Who do you say that I am? The same question that Jesus is asking his disciples is the same question that's being asked not only to us here today, but it's actually the question that is asked to all humanity. And this is the question of eternal destiny because the way one answers this question in their heart will determine where they awake in eternity. I was talking to Michael this morning. We know that um, uh, Joan Chizar and Michael and Mary Patrick and uh, J.D. Pullman were in a, a pretty serious, could have been, could have turned out to be a very, very, very serious accident about three weeks ago when their car uh, hydroplaned and went over into Boulder Creek. And Joan just had a report. All four, Joan, Mike and Mary, and JT, all walked away from this accident with, uh, you know, just maybe some scratches and bruise and being shaken up a little bit. But I understand that Joan had spoken to uh, recently uh, one of the highway patrol investigators, and I guess just within a, a moment uh, of a very short time, I don't know if it was, was it a couple days, was it hours, was it uh, the same day, or was it uh, within just a few days or so of your accident? Same day. Uh, there were several accidents within that very same area where one person was, it was a fatality, another person was paralyzed, and another person is in the hospital today with, uh, um, with, brain, uh, with brain damage. And uh, Mike and Mary and Joan and JT all uh, walked away from that. They could have crossed that line into eternity, folks. We could have been doing funerals. We could have been uh, um, doing funerals. Rejoicing, yes, that we know where Joan and Mike and Mary and, and JT would have been had the Lord decided that that was it for them. But that, I want to just, I just, I just what I'm try, the point that I'm trying to make is that in a moment, in a moment, eternity, in a moment, one could wake up in eternity. And how one answers this question that Jesus is presenting to his Disciples today will determine whether one wakes up in the presence of the living God or separated from Him for all eternity. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Whenever anything else becomes the issue other than Jesus Christ, the real issue 
is being ignored. The issue is not what you think about Calvary Chapel. The issue is not what you think about Chuck Smith. The issue is not what you think about Richie Fure. The issue is what you think about Jesus Christ. It isn't what one thinks about any church denomination or organization, any religion, or any person. But what do you believe in your heart about Jesus Christ? Who do you say He is? Who do you say He is? And what was the revelation that Peter responded with? Verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I like that, man. Peter just steps right up to the plate, man, and he just swings, and he connects for a grand slam home run just like that. I don't think he... Hmm, how am I going to answer this question? I think it was right there. The fact is, I know it was right there from what Jesus will say to him in just a minute. But he said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. And Christ would be the, the Greek equivalent of Messiah. You are the anointed one, the deliverer, the high priest, the prophet, the savior. Not exactly the one that Israel was maybe expecting at that time. They were expecting some king to come in and, and establish his earthly uh, reign and, 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 and do away with the Roman oppression right there at that moment. They weren't expecting the suffering Savior to come. They weren't expecting one uh, who would come such as a lowly servant to die upon that Roman cross. But nevertheless, Peter proclaimed and testified in no uncertain terms, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. Now, people have problems with Jesus being the Son of God. If He's God, He's God. If He's the Son of God, He's the Son of God. And so this is an excuse that a lot of people have from coming to Christianity or from coming to Christ to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because they want to believe that there is one God. Well, Christianity and the Bible teaches that there is one God, but that one God is manifest in three persons. Now, I understand that the Trinity or the, the concept, the idea of the triune God is not an easy concept for the finite mind to grasp onto. One man said, Try to explain the Trinity and you'll drive yourself crazy. Deny it. And you'll end up in an eternity separated from God. And so it is difficult. But Jesus, as the Son of God, really speaks of His place in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it speaks of His place in the Trinity, but it speaks of His submission to God the Father when He really came to earth. He is God the Son. And when Jesus came to this earth, He did not set aside His deity in any way, shape, or form. He did set aside the glory of His deity. But He didn't set aside His deity. He was, is, and always will be God the Son, the second person of the Godhead. And this is what the Bible teaches, though man has had difficulty in understanding it. They are equal in essence, in will, in determination, and yet they are separate and distinct, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit from one another. Uh, the, the, um, you know, there, there's been analogies and um, I don't know if this is going to be uh, good you know, for me to, to give you this analogy because one person said this isn't a very good theological example. So if it's not, you'll know where I stand theologically, but no. <laughs> um, but uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same in essence, in will, in purpose. And 
I kind of think of, you, you can't change the properties of water if it's a solid or if it's a steam, you know, or, or, a, or a vapor. It's H2O. And so I see, you know, that analogy of, of the solid, the ice and the water and the steam as, you know, a, a, at least a representation for a simple mind like mine to be able to, to grasp and, and to understand. There are some other ones that, you know, are, are difficult, but, you know, try that one on and then if you want my resignation, just <laughs> put it in the uh, offering box, you know. But uh, we try to be as theologically accurate as we can, but, um, oh well. I'm going to have a drink of water here, <laughs> and then we're going to get on with this. So Jesus answered, verse 17, and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, speaking of him as being the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood, now see what Jesus says to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is not something, let me tell you, that Peter figured out on his own. It was a revelation from God. God revealed this to him, and I believe that the Father revealed it to him right there on the spot. It wasn't because of hard work. It wasn't because of years of study. It wasn't because of spending all of this time that Jesus, that Peter came to this conclusion on his own. But the truth was revealed to him by the grace of God and to every other person who will humbly and honestly and sincerely come to the Father seeking the truth of who Jesus is in their heart. You know, there are a lot of people that can sit in churches today, week after week after week, and still don't come to a right understanding of who Jesus is. There are people that have gone to seminary year after year after year that do not understand. And they're standing in quote-unquote Christian pulpits around the country and around the world today. There are theologians that deny you know, really a lot of the cardinal doctrines of our faith and even concerning Jesus Christ. I don't know what these guys are sitting around, you know, trying to do, trying to figure out. It's all right here. A revelation from God. And the light comes on when one is sincerely seeking in their heart. So Jesus said, blessed. You're a happy guy, Peter. <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven, and I will also, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." I believe that it's a shame that this awesome, awesome confession of faith has been misapplied and misrepresented by the Roman church today. Nowhere does the scripture remotely intimate that what Jesus is saying here, that Peter is the rock upon which, and the foundation upon which his church. Notice, it's my church, he says. I'm building my church. And nowhere does it say that Jesus is going to build his church upon Peter. Fact is, the word that he uses for Peter here is the word in the Greek Petra, which means little stone. And so what he's saying, and I say to you, little stone, on this rock, on this Petros, on this massive, huge declaration that you have just made up on that confession of faith, I will build my church. That's what he is saying. Try to exalt and glorify and honor him in any other way is something that I'm sure that Peter would just be horrendous. He would never accept this. Nor what Jesus had in mind. Rock is an Old Testament word used God. And Deut an example, Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, The Lord Jehovah is my rock and my fortress. You know, there were many things that Peter got rebuked for. Many stupid and dumb things, you know, that he said and he was corrected for and he was rebuked for. But I'm sure, you know, here the Lord said, Blessed are, I mean, the Lord said, Blessed are you, son of Barjona, for blood is not real this to you, but my Father is in heaven. 
No other shed can be laid, which is laid. Jesus the Messiah spoke of the queen one who is the and he saw him one hundred and of uh, Isaiah sixteen. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I in Zion alone form day shide so precious corn sure and we know that stone is Jesus. Um, there is the foundation of the church we built. Peter's confession faith testified to that truth was written about Jesus. You know, obviously there's a whole lot more that we need to get into and we will be getting into it in the next week and some of these things uh, that Jesus said. But I think the most important thing is answering that question. Who do you say that he is? Why is it men are afraid of Jesus? Why is it that they're afraid to embrace him whose arms are outstretched to embrace them. What did he ever do that was so offensive to man? Why is it that man is so offended by him? Why is it that men want to make him less than who he is? Why is it that man wants to have more than one God. Any God, as we read this morning, other than the one true living God of the Bible, is a God that has been made with man's hands or conjured up in his heart and mind and is, a, is his own creation and is totally useless and helpless and unable to deliver man from his sin. Peter in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that He is King of kings, and Lord of Lords. And this is what Peter was saying of Jesus in his confession, that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He is the one and the only true and living God who came to take away the sin of the world. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Why is it the man has to stand at arm's length from him when his arms remain outstretched even to this day to receive all who will come to him and will bow before his throne, bow before the cross and receive a gift, the free gift of salvation that he offers to all who will come to him. Why does man fight this rather than surrender to him and be saved? I think we all know why. And no matter how many things we could say, how many things we could elaborate on, it always boils down to one thing. It boils down to pride. That's what it boils down to. Because pride is the number one killer of man. Pride will keep men from bowing their knees and bowing their heart before Jesus Christ today and receiving Him as their personal Lord and Savior. They'll try and figure it out. They'll try and be good enough. They'll try and do works. They'll try and find another God. They'll find, try and find a church. They'll try and find this. When Jesus says, Here I am for all to see. I was raised up 2,000 years ago for all to see that He shed His blood for the forgiveness our sin. But what if there's another way? Some will ask. What if there's another way to heaven? Hmm. Well, if there's another way to heaven, or if he's just one of many ways to heaven, I'm in, along with everyone else. But if he is, as he said he was, the way, the truth, the life, then that all of a sudden, whoosh, there's a dividing line. And that separates some from others. Who do you say He is? Who do you say Jesus is? Have you made Him the Lord of your life? Have you made Him your Savior? Or are you still resting on good works? Have you still resting on a church? Are you still resting on 
something other than, some other issue than the issue who is Jesus Christ. You know, I heard one uh, so obnoxiously the other day on the radio. Um, conversation was going on and it was, uh, prove to me God. Prove to me there is a God. And this person so humbly, you know, was just saying, you know, just look around you. Just look around. The heavens declare the glory of God. And this person broke out in a cynical, satanic laugh. The one in control of the radio show, you know, mockingly. But I want to tell you something. The Bible never, you know, even determines or attempts to prove God. The very first scripture in the Bible says, in the beginning, God. That's it. And so man has to come in faith and believe what the Bible declares, or he walks away not believing. And we know throughout the account of the Bible, and the account in the book of Acts, you know, as the apostles would go from town to town and they would preach the gospel, and they would say, some believed and some didn't. But even as in those towns years ago, the gospel has been delivered to you today. And no one will walk out this door today without knowing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who came to take away the sin of the world. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, as Peter's, neither is there salvation in any other. It's not belonging to a church, but it's belonging to Him. As we said so many times, it's not having your name written on a church register someplace, but it's about your name being written in blood in the Lamb's Book of Life. Are you sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in the blood of of the Lamb. That's key. That's critical. That will determine your salvation. Let's pray. Father, we spent a lot of time working up to this today, Lord. As you spoke to your disciples so long ago, Lord, drawing out of them, Lord, it's not what public consensus is. It's not what popular opinion is, but it's personal. And so, Lord, right now, as our heads are bowed, and Lord, as everyone here is, is giving thought to this very question today, who do you personally say that Jesus is? Is He your Lord, your Savior, or was he just another good man? Was he just another prophet? How you answer that question today will determine your eternal destiny. Father, my prayer today is that everyone that is in this room today will not leave here without the assurance of their salvation today by humbling themselves and coming, Lord, before the throne of the mighty God and receiving, Lord, the gift that is there for them because they believe. Because, Lord, they would confess in their heart that they are a sinner and that they need a Savior. And, that, Lord, that they would receive the free gift of salvation and be washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ today and be clothed in the righteousness of God which is in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that today hearts would be changed. I pray, Lord, today that believers' hearts would be changed, Lord, because we are humbled and in awe because of the awesome grace that we know in our hearts because of faith in you. Lord, if there are any here this morning, any at all, Lord, who have joined us today, who have never come into that personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray today that is the day and that no one will walk out of here without receiving from you today, Lord, that free gift. If there is anyone here this morning, anyone who has joined us today, who has never come into that personal and that living relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, won't you come today? His arms are outstretched to you today. His arms are calling out to you. His heart is calling out to you. 
saying, I love you very much, enough so that I would come 2,000 years ago and lay my life down for you. I want the gospel message to be very clear today. It's not what Richie thinks, but it's what the Bible says. And the Bible says that God gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior today? If you were in one of those car accidents a week ago, where would you be in eternity right now? Would you be in eternity separated from God or would you be in the presence of Him? Because you know Him and you know His grace and you have received the forgiveness of your sin through faith in Him. If you don't have that assurance today, I want to pray for you. But it has to be something that you have determined in your own heart that you want to receive Christ's forgiveness for your sin today. Can I pray for you today? If I can pray for you this morning, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal...